Welcome everyone to Being Patients Live Talk. This is Nicholas. And um, today uh, we have a retired physician, uh, Jennifer Butte here from the UK to speak about us with her, about her uh, experience living with Alzheimer's uh, after being diagnosed with early onset uh, form of the disease in 2009. So Jennifer, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Nice so to be Jennifer, here, thank you. Jennifer, I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, now you live in a retirement village. That's a dementia friendly community. Um, can you tell us about, you know, uh, what has your experience been like living there? Yes, I like to call it dementia inclusive rather than dementia friendly. I mean, for very many reasons. And it's been brilliant. My husband found it for us when I couldn't cope with living um, with life in my own house, I couldn't run it anymore. And my husband, who loved me dearly, found the only way would be to go somewhere where there was help. So I've been living in this village for 10 years now, and it's wonderful. It is a, a gated community, but it has about 200 people living here, and 80 are in the advanced dementia unit, 30 in the nursing home, and the rest are in independent living with 24 hour backup support when we need it. Mm -hmm. So for me, this is absolutely perfect because in England, many dementia um, care homes and residential places take all your independence away. And I believe that that disables us rather than enabling us. And I think it helps people to become more dependent and to progress more rapidly so it's very good so here I have my own flat with a lounge dining room kitchen bedroom but we also have in the complex a restaurant together with other things and I can go to the restaurant for my meals if I want to but I don't have to or I can have them delivered to my flat if I want to we have 24-hour porters 24-hour um, carers um, we have administrative staff the we pay a monthly fee and but if we want extra help we have to pay for that of course but for me it's it's wonderful we have grounds which i don't have to look after and if the roof leaks it's not my problem <laughs> <laughs> right and you know you mentioned that at the time you know your husband decided that you know it's time to move to um to this village you know how, what was, you know, how did you feel about it? And what was the discussion like for you? Because, you know, move, you have to move away from, from home, right? I didn't want to. I didn't. I thought it was too soon. But I understood that my husband loved me dearly, but he couldn't cope with a wife who once was very competent to one that was no longer competent. <laughs> and we had a large house and garden, which was open, to everybody we were welcomed we had people staying with us who needed help and care and support we've always been like that in our married life we've always shared what we had and I would come home and look go into the lounge and I think who are all these people in here and it was very embarrassing for my husband wasn't it <laughs> when the hostess didn't know who her visitors or her guests were or forgot to cook for them <laughs> the evening came so it was a disaster not because I didn't care or he didn't care, but I couldn't remember. <laughs> and he wasn't able to give me the cues and the reminders to help me going. So I didn't want to come here, but I'm so very glad I did. He made the right decision because he died soon after we arrived and I could not have coped without him. Mm. And at, at the village, you know, you receive, you get the care and the support that um, you need, but at the same time, you're also able to help others and um, interact and be friends with others who are living with dementia as well, right? Which has been it's such wonderful. a big part. Yeah. Wonderful opportunity to continue being of help and care and to learn from their stories because I'm still learning. <laughs> and Jennifer, I want to go back in time a little bit now um, to speak about, you know, um, before your diagnosis, um, at the time when you were still practicing as a general uh, practitioner in the UK. Um, you know, you, men you mentioned in our conversation before this interview that, 
you know, some of the early symptoms of Alzheimer's you experienced was at work. Um, can you tell us about a little bit about that? Yes, because I had no idea to start with that I had um, dementia. My father had dementia, um, so and I had patients with it, but I couldn't. Never thought that I would get it. So it started really with getting lost. I still remember the time when I drove to the surgery where I'd worked for 25 years and I couldn't find my way. I had no idea where it was. And you know, I phoned up the surgery and I said, I can't find my way. And they just laughed at me. <laughs> and then when I, I eventually found I couldn't get home and I'd phone up my husband and said, do I go left or do I go right? And he'd tell me not to be so stupid. I mean, he loved me dearly. So I thought this is just something small that's happened to me. I'll buy a sat nav. <laughs> You know, one of these things to tell you where to go in the car. So that's what I did. And then the next thing I knew was that I was having all these olfactory hallucinations, smelling things, which was a bit of a nuisance, you know, getting all the drains checked and goodness knows what else and so on. So that wasn't good. And then not recognizing people. The first time it happened, I went to visit a patient and somebody in the room jumped up and hugged me. And I thought, what? Who's this person? You know, patients don't hug people, hug the doctor. I had a clue who she was, not a clue. And it was several weeks later that I met her in another context. And she said, oh, how lovely to see you at my father's the other, you know, the other week, Jennifer. And she was my neighbour that I'd lived, you know, I'd known for years. So those were the first kind of signs, really. Um, but I... I didn't give up then. I just found coping strategies. And, um, you know, Jennifer, you met, and how did you, like, what, what do you think was wrong then at the time? Because, you know, um, you know, you, you mentioned that you didn't expect that you would have Alzheimer's and you were young at the time too, right? Like, yes. what do you think was going on? Well, I think I joined the club of those who like to deny it. Don't you think so? <laughs> I think a lot of people with dementia just pretend they don't have it. And I think I was like that. Um, I don't know why. I wasn't consciously denying it. But, and the fact that my husband wouldn't admit there was anything the matter with me. He just told me to pull my socks up and try a bit harder. I mean, he wasn't horrid in any way, but, you know, he couldn't understand why I couldn't do what I used to do. And it was only when I reached that stage, I think I mentioned it to you in this, that really made me realize something serious was the matter with me. When I was, because I was a senior partner, I was chairing a meeting and there were about, I don't know how many people in the room, say a dozen. And I didn't know who any of them were, not a single person. So I turned to the person on my, on my left and I said, welcoming everyone how lovely to see you all you know now we need to introduce each other because I don't know who any of you are and the person on my left said of course you do of course you do we've known each other for 25 years we've worked together so I said then went on to the next person and said the same to them and all around the room I realized that it was me I couldn't make an excuse they all knew who I was, and I didn't know who a single one was. Um, and and that, that, was, the, that was like way, the final straw for you. That was the final straw, yes. Yeah. That was the yeah. final and, straw. and the diagnostic process, that was actually quite a difficult and emotional process for you, right? Um, and it was a long one, too. Can you um, walk us through that experience? And I, I think that's it's interesting, too, because you you were a doctor at the time, too, right? Yes. Yeah, can you well, that was the problem. You see, I was a well-known, well-respected doctor in the town where I lived. So when I went to the hospital to see the neurologist with my husband, before we'd even sat down, the neurologist said to me, I gather you're concerned you've got dementia. I can tell you you haven't. But before he didn't do anything, he didn't do any scans or tests, nothing. He just told me before I sat down that there was nothing the matter with me, which was humiliating, I felt. So it took me quite a while to agree to go back. But in England, we have what we call general practitioners, kind of family doctors. And he knew I had dementia because we'd also been on various committees together. And eventually he persuaded me to go and see a different neurologist. <laughs> So I went to see a different neurologist 
because I trusted my um, family doctor. And the neurologist did do a scan and everything and ask questions and so on. And then he said to me, Jennifer, I'm not prepared to give you a diagnosis because you're too good a doctor for us to lose. We need people like you. Well, that wasn't any help either, was it? So I wasn't happy about that. So I asked to be referred to a neuro, um, some other professor who spent two days doing tests and so on and said, you need to see someone who specializes in early onset dementia. So I did. I went to see a third neurologist who then, of course, told me, right. confirmed. How, how did you feel when, you know, that well, the, the third neurologist confirmed her diagnosis? I was pleased at long last, someone believed me, that I was having all these problems because before that, I felt that everyone thought I was just making it up. Right. So it's like, finally, you know, um, it confirmed what, um, you know, what you were feeling at the time, right? Of what was go what was wrong um, going on. Right? So I denied to start with, obviously, and then was relief when I, at long last, others also agreed. Mm -hmm. Right. And I want to speak a little bit about, you know, your transition from being um, a doctor uh, to retirement, right? Um, you know, what was that like for you? And, you know, how did you tell your colleagues how did they react and how did you adapt to your transition? They reacted very badly. They didn't believe me. They said, you know, we can't do without you. And I said, you've got to because my patients meant too much. Just imagine standing up in court and saying, I'm sorry, I've got dementia. I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, you wouldn't stand a chance, would you? <laughs> so I wouldn't listen to them. I was so sure that I was right. So I, and we have to have insurance obviously to practice. So I phoned them up and said, I'd received this diagnosis. And they said, fine, we won't cover you anymore. So I couldn't work anymore. So that was good. Um, I mean, I deliberately did that. So my partners, my medical partner said, well, you can't just walk out unless you'll have to do something. So the defense union said that they wouldn't cover my clinical skills with other people, but I could still do paperwork. So I had to work just doing paperwork for six months. Um, and then I left completely. And because I've been involved in medical education and writing um, educational leaflets for patients, not just mine, but you know, for the whole um, county, I started writing leaflets about dementia. It was just something I'd always done. So I thought, well, that's something I can still do. <laughs> So I wrote those and that was how it all started um, because. And writing those leaf, those um, leaflets about dementia was really important, right? Because um, one of the diff one of the challenges that you experienced um, throughout the diagnostic process was that there was um, very little information actually for the patients and their families about yes. dementia, right? Yes. Yes, I found there was nothing, absolutely nothing out there at all. Um, that was what, how many years ago now? You can do the maths. It was quite a long time, wasn't it? And there wasn't anything there for people, which is why I wrote my leaflets mm. and became so passionate about helping other people because so many people with dementia are just given a diagnosis and left almost to rot um, or to just wait. But that's so silly because I think someone said to me this morning, you know, dementia is not a, a death sentence. It's just a word. <laughs> And I thought that was quite good, but we can do something to slow down the progression. And as a doctor, I realized that there were many people living in our communities with illnesses, terminal illnesses. It's not just dementia, for goodness sake. They were living with terminal illness, but there was a lot you could do to slow down the progression in all fields, you know, whether it's with muscular things or blood conditions or lung conditions, there's treatment. So I thought, well, let's do something for dementia. But nobody seemed to believe it, um, apart from a few drugs that were around and many that aren't, uh, thought to be, but aren't. But there are other things we can do. So that's what I set my uh, mind and heart to, to find out, which is why I have the privilege of this opportunity of living in this village to find out things that I can, having living amongst these people with dementia, 
um, for so many years, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, I find out what works and what doesn't work and learn from their stories because everyone with dementia is different, mm -hmm. everyone. And Jennifer, I wanna um, speak about, you know, some of the things that you're involved with in terms of, um, you know, hosting activities with residents at the retirement village in a little bit. But first, I want to I also, you know, from your book that you authored, uh, Dementia from the Inside, um, throughout the book, you mentioned how important the Christian faith has been for you, you know, growing up. Um, and I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, your, your diagnosis and your relationship with the Christian, with the church community after your diagnosis. And I was wondering, um, right after you were diagnosed, how did your church community react um, before you moved to um, the retirement village and then the church community where you, after you moved to dementia friendly community? Well, the, the vicar, priest, minister, whatever you like to call him, he and his wife were brilliant. Um, they came round to see me and my husband and were very supportive. But looking back on it, it was almost as if I had a terminal illness and was going to die soon. But they were very supportive um, and in no way um, suggested I was no longer welcome because I'd been involved quite a lot with the church. But because one of the teams I was involved with, which was pastoral care, I went to one of their meetings and I heard them talking about some other people in the congregation because it was a big church who had dementia. And I can remember two things that were said. One was, well, there's no point visiting them because they won't remember whether you visited them or not. And the other type of response was how disgraceful it was that so-and-so's family didn't bother to do X, Y, Z for the person, which I knew wasn't true. But I also knew that the person with dementia had obviously forgotten. So I thought, well, this is just dreadful. You know, if I'm going to be in this church and have dementia and get progress and these people are going to have that attitude. So I asked the, the you know, the, the vicar in charge who had been so supportive of me, if I could give a talk to the whole of the pastoral team and the church leadership, because having been involved in education, you know, I lectured at the university, I thought I could still do that. So I did. I gave them a talk and... It was so well received. I was asked if my son could record it. I could give it again. My son could record it. So that's how my website actually started. <laughs> he set it up as a glorious opportunity because I said my dementia was a glorious opportunity to help others. So that's how the website actually started. So I'm very, very grateful to that particular vicar. <laughs> and is it hard for um, for... Uh, people living with dementia and their families to talk to the church community, you know, friends at the church or, you know, pastors of the team about their diagnosis. Do you, do you think that's a hard thing for people to do often? Yes, I think it is because people are frightened of it. I know there were people in the church who, when I said to them, because I decided the only way was to be quite open about it and to use it as an opportunity to, to help and educate and to lower the stigma because there was so much stigma. It's certainly less now than it was. And if somebody would just walk away, if I told them, I would chase them and I'd say, I'm not infectious, you know, but what's the problem? <laughs> why, why don't you feel comfortable talking to me? You know, can I help in any way? And then I would give them one of my leaflets, <laughs> which were very useful for educating them. Um, so that was a good idea. And then I would make a lot of the people who, who supported me. I remember one other lady in the, this same church, because um, I'm in a different one now. I said to her, oh, I'm unwinding at the moment. I'm unraveling. You know, it's so difficult unraveling. So she said, well, I don't think that's so. She said, my grandmother used to unravel as much as she could with her old jumpers. And she wouldn't, she would wind up the wall and she'd make it into something even better. <laughs> and that was a silly kind of encouragement to me mm -hmm. that this person, even if they didn't understand a lot about dementia, understood that even if we have a condition, a disease or whatever, in God's hands, it can actually be knitted up into something different and better in his sight and useful perhaps to more people than otherwise. Mm. Right. And you mentioned that, 
you know, one of the members in the pastoral team uh, at the church before you moved to the retirement village mentioned um, was asking whether it's worth visiting um, a member of the church because they won't, they probably won't remember the visit anymore. You know, on that particular note, you know, how do you, you know, what do you think is a better way to think about it then? Um, oh, so much so because I have three principles. The first is always a reason for everything that we do or say, if we have dementia, it's not completely random. And the second is that feelings remain when facts are forgotten. So if someone visits someone, they will remember the visit, even if they don't know who the visitor was or when it was or when they came. They can bring joy to the person, even if the person doesn't remember it was them. So, of course, it's worth visiting someone with dementia, no matter how advanced their dementia is. And the fact they can't remember it was you, you know, can be quite useful at times because, you know, you don't want everyone talking about you all the time. So, um, so that's lovely. And when I hear people say, you know, here, oh, you know, so good. Someone saw me yesterday or somebody said that's an... You know, and I think, good, it's worth it. It's worth it. They remember the feelings that you communicate. So, of course, it's worth visiting people with dementia, even if they don't know who you are and don't remember. Mm -hmm. Right. And do you find that it's common, the case that, you know, people with dementia and their families um, stop going to church because perhaps, you know, others haven't responded too well or, you know, just the fact that going to church can actually be a challenge, you know, sitting at the service for an hour. Yes, yes, it can be on many levels. Um, as you probably got, I have an obstinate streak in me. So, <laughs> you know, when I went to a church, when I moved to this village and went to a church and I couldn't cope with something, I can't remember what it was now, and I started to cry, which is what I do when I can't cope because we resort to childhood patterns. And that's what I did as a child. I didn't kick and stream and throw things and shout like some people with dementia do. <laughs> I, I just curl up in a ball and cry and go and hide. So I'd kind of hang onto the wall and cry. And I was told that I was an embarrassment and I ought to, ought to leave. I wasn't welcome. So I said, well, I don't think that's how Jesus would have responded. Um, it's because I have dementia. Let me give you a leaflet to explain <laughs> all it means. It's a cry for help. And what causes these meltdowns, as I call them in church for me, is when something unexpected happens. So if you can warn me in advance that something unexpected is going to happen, then I won't need to perform in this embarrassing way <laughs> for you. <laughs> So it's a matter of learning and teaching the church how to cope with these people. So, you know, you go to church, they say, oh, we can't have people with dementia because they interrupt or they do something else or they get up and walk around or, well, does it matter? We let, in many churches, they let children run around, don't they, um, up and down. They don't seem to mind them. So if someone with, you know, older person with dementia gets up and walks around and then comes and sits down again, why should we mind about that? Um, it's just often I think children get more respect and understanding than sometimes older people do. But sometimes um, churches go the other way and they become so patronising. I can remember one church I went to and they said, oh, we hear you've got dementia. Come and sit in the front with the children and then you can go out with the children and go in the creche while we have the sermon. I said, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Well, it's appalling, isn't it? So I didn't get cross with them. I said, let me explain, let me educate them, let me give you some, you know, um, and explain, you know, what churches can do positively to make people with dementia feel welcome. So if a church isn't welcoming for dementia, you know, it's not a matter of telling them off, it's a matter of explaining to them, and giving them the facilities and the strategies to cope and as I said to you, I have written, I was asked to write a leaflet on that subject. Um, so I need to check whether it's on my website and make sure it gets there. Yes. Right. And yeah, that's, so that's one of the ways how you respond to a situation, right? Is that, you know, you try to educate people about, you know, the challenges that you and others living with dementia experience. So then 
they can find ways to best support you, right? Um, and yeah, and Jennifer, going back to your point that you made now earlier in our conversation about um, um, the fact that you mentioned that there are things that you can do to slow the progression of dementia. Can you tell us about um, some of the things that you think can slow the progression of the disease and are very important to, to keep doing um, when you're living with dementia? Yes. Well, when I was a doctor, I was very much an evidence-based doctor. You know, it's not just what I think, it's what is the scientific evidence. And there have been, there have been a lot of... Um, a lot of research done on the subject on different aspects, um, some very important ones, which when I'm you know, speaking to a scientific audience, I could you know, label them all out. So in the end, I picked out the bits because each project had one or two things, but there are really just, what, five basic things that, that work. And I decided to make it into a or whatever you call it, sledge, getting on your sledge with musical accompaniment. <laughs> so sledge, S-L-E-D-G-E, -E, actually stands for five things, not six, plus the music, so you could say it's six. So the S and the E at the beginning of the, I've actually got it written out here, um, so is the social engagement. Everything done to keep someone with dementia keeping well must be done within the context of social engagement. People with dementia who shut themselves away because they're ashamed or they don't feel welcome, which happens, they will progress faster than those who keep socially active. And that is a definite fact. So within the concept of social engagement, which of course in this place, you know, we, we're all socially engaged um, and that is why so many of us last do so well. We last so long. <laughs> it's because of the social engagement. And the L stands for laughter. Because laughter is wonderful. Scientifically, you know, if you laugh, really laugh, not just you know, smile a bit, you release cortisol, which makes the body feel better and helps the brain. It's kind of wrapping it all up in good stuff. And I found that people with advanced dementia who don't talk even, if you get them really laughing about something, usually it's me having made a mistake or made up and, and they laugh at me. Well, that's fine. I don't mind if people laugh at me. The laughter seems to tie up the ends in their brain and they're able to talk for a bit afterwards. So laughter is very important. And then the E stands for exercise and enjoyment. Um, we have to keep fit. Again, sitting in a chair isn't going to help. We know we have to keep fit, whatever our medical condition. We need to, to walk. And I think many of us, when we were young, we had teachers or lecturers that walked up and down because our brain works better while we're walking or exercising. So that's important. And then the D, the sledge, the D, is the, the diet. Again, we've got to um, eat sensibly, you know, cut down the carbohydrates and eat you know, healthily. And the daily activities, you've got to have your routines, which help. So that's the D. And the G is a bit of a cheat, but I couldn't think of any other thing that would work and or think of another word that would have all of them in it. <laughs> Stands for the cognitive stimulation, which is what keeps the brain alive. And it's not brain training, like doing your jigsaw, um, your, your crossword every day. I mean, that's a good thing to do, but that is not cognitive stimulation that's brain training down one particular avenue which is good nothing wrong with it but we can do better than that and this all started off when I was talking on dementia at a conference in London at a big center and there was it was a two-day conference with lots of speakers on dementia and there was a person from J Japan who spoke on um, what they were doing in Japan it was someone called Professor Kawashima and he spoke how in Japan, because they could there, we can't in England, you probably can't in the United States either. Um, they could make people do things if they were living in a care home, you know, they'd have to come. So they found that if they made people in these care homes do three things, they actually got better. And they showed video evidence of a lady who was lying in bed, not saying a word and being fed. 
a few months later sitting up in a wheelchair feeding herself with a spoon. And a lady in a care home was being, oh, so difficult and disruptive and aggressive. She was made to come along to his sessions and she became completely different. She became calm and peaceful. So I listened carefully what he was actually making them do. And I thought, well, all he's making them do are the three R's, as we call them here, the reading, writing and arithmetic, because that is how our brains were tied up. When we were young, they were fired up to learn. You know, even before you went to school, you know, you're taught your numbers and your letters and, you know, how to use a pencil. And so the reading, writing and arithmetic. And he had found out with his research in Japan that if, if they did that in the same period of time, and that's the important thing, it's not saying, well, I read a book every day. It's got to be the three of them in the same period of time on a regular basis. He said there was evidence to show that it either prevented, slowed down, or even improved dementia and memory problems. And that so inspired I, you to yeah. um, establish the uh, the Japanese memory group at your uh, retirement village, right? Can you tell us more about that? <laughs> yes, I thought if this is true, why on earth aren't we doing it? So I thought reading, writing, arithmetic, well, that's kind of preschool reception stuff. So I stupidly got some preschool stuff and decided to try that on some people and of course as adults and older they were insulted to be given childish things to do so as i'd been involved in education i thought well i can adapt this that's all right we can find other things to do with reading so we would read a song or sing a song um reading poetry and i discovered the rhythm of that and i found that people even responding to the music um, of singing the song. This had an amazing effect on them too. Whereas if we didn't sing a song, it, they weren't so good during the rest of the session. And reading a poem, even people who came to my course, because we have all levels of dementia, you know, advanced dementia, not saying a word, they would join in a well-known poem. It had to be a well-known poem with rhythm. They would join in. And I thought, this is amazing. Um, you know, that's wonderful. So I would produce these pieces of paper for people at different levels. And I, I couldn't cope with that. You know, I was progressing myself slowly, though. So I decided I had to put it into a booklet that had something for everybody in it. And that's what I do now. And the management here in the village pay for it all now because they've seen the difference it makes in the village. Mm. And that, again, is on my website, isn't it? Yes. And is this a group that you run, like, uh, on a weekly basis, like once a Twice week? Twice a week, yes. Twice a week. Twice a week. Right. Mm. Yeah, and that must be really meaningful for yourself, too, right, to be able to, you know. I love it. And I just love it. It gives people hope. And I have relatives saying, you know, my dad's got to come into your group. And I say, well, I can't make him. Well, we'll make sure he comes. <laughs> So it's lovely if I, you know, I have the support of the relatives as well. And it, it's lovely. And obviously, over the years, you know, people have died. They've, of course, they do. That's why we come here. We don't plan to move anywhere else. And over the last 10 years, I guess I've lost 100 people. Well, it's only 10 a year, isn't it? Um, and people at all stages, there are 200 people. It's not that many, is it? Um, mm. But I have, there are 100 people because I keep a register of it. But then other people come in and I don't have that number at any one time. You know, I normally have about 40 people on my books at one time. And of course, during COVID, you know, we all lost people during COVID, didn't we? Um, mm. But there are new people coming in all the time into the village. So I've still got 40 people on my books. <laughs> mm, right. And one of the things that's really important to you is, um, is to enable people rather than to disable, right? Um, and can you, yeah, can you tell us more about, you know, what that means and um, how has that, um, how has that phrase been important to the members who join your support group and to, to be enabled rather than to be disabled? Yes, well, people are so often, I mean, they're kind. You know, they do it with the best of intentions, but they'll come in and they'll say, you know, I, you know, I make a mess of something. I burn something. I set the fire alarm off and they say, oh, you're not to cook anymore. And I say, well, that's no good. I, you know, 
I need a per well, everyone with dementia needs a purpose um, and a role and to feel a value. And if everything's taken away from you because you're not able to do it anymore because you've made a, a mistake with it or a serious mistake, perhaps, so, you know, had the fire people here. The answer is not to say, don't do it anymore, which is what they so often do. The answer is to say, let's work out a strategy as to how to do it. And I remember the, the first book I ever read on dementia that really <clears throat> encouraged me to do my weekly blogs and um, the book event, you know, before that was someone called Richard Taylor, who's died. He was American. Um, and he's written a book. I can't remember what it was called now, but and in it, he found out that if he wrote about his experiences, it would help him cope with it. So he used to write about his experiences. And one of the chapters I remember, so I read this book, he said, I can't do the garden anymore. I just can't work out, you know, the order to do things. So he said, I called the family together and told them that I couldn't do the garden anymore. And he said, they were so cross with me. They said, well, we're not going to do it. And I thought to myself, oh dear, you weren't asking them to do it. You were asking them to enable you to continue doing it by having some strategy or you know some this is what you do on one day this is what you do on another he needed help to continue doing what he was doing mm. so that is so important because it keeps us going for far longer mm. if we can be enabled to still do things that we once enjoyed and found purpose in and jennifer you know my last question here is um you know when you were a doctor, you had cared for patients who were diagnosed with dementia. Um, I was wondering, you know, what have you learned about dementia that you didn't know before at the time when you were a doctor? What, what do I know now that I didn't know then? Yeah. Oh, a tremendous amount. <laughs> a tremendous amount. I feel so ashamed. I wasn't proactive. I didn't understand about the enabling. And the same with my father who had dementia. I, I couldn't, I didn't know, you know, I'd, I'd visit him often, of course, and help, you know, care for him. And he wouldn't know who I was and he would think I was my mother. Well, that was fine. I could understand and cope with that. But then I would try and use logic on him. He was a very intelligent man and I'd try and explain things. Well, that was a complete waste of time. I was very patient, you know, I never got cross with them but it was a completely the wrong way to deal with it. It was not purposeful. What I should have done, I realize now, would have been to either change the subject or divert it, or for example, he loved books. So instead of worrying about books, I'd say, well, this is an interesting book on, on the table. You know, let's look at that, or, or you know, what about this book? So to use what he was trying to do, not use logic, but to take that where he was, and to develop that, in, but in a slightly different way to what he was doing. Or talk, he was talking about somebody. Instead of trying to use logic that that person couldn't come or had died or whatever, would be to say, well, tell me about them. You know, tell me stories about them. So I didn't know that then. Right. And it's it's important to step into that person's reality right yes that's, that's an important and often thing. you can bring them back to yours and that i have really found out because i know a lot of people think if people are living in a different reality they think it's permanent it isn't i and i've learned that from living in this village here people who think people they're somewhere else or people are alive or other countries and it's just amazing and people with dementia do remember some things um if i've got time to quickly tell you one story i went to visit I was called to, to help with one lady um, who was being a bit disruptive. So I took her off into the lounge and she thought I was her aunt, her aunt Maud. Well, I, I wasn't, but I wasn't going to tell her that she was silly. I thought, well, aunt, she was, she smiled. So aunt Maud was obviously popular. So I said, oh, nice to see you again. You know, come along and tell me what you've been up to. And, oh, she's so lovely to see, you know, living here in New Zealand. I thought, well, not living in New Zealand, but that's where she thought she was. So I've never been to New Zealand either. But, you know, we, we 
I accepted where she was. And she said, well, we're waiting, aren't we, for my brother to arrive? Well, I knew her brother was dead. So I didn't say, well, don't be so silly. I said, oh, what do you remember best about your brother? What are you looking forward to most? I didn't say he was coming. You know, I didn't tell any lie. I don't believe it's right to ever tell lies. So she would tell me stories about him. And I remember one on this occasion, because it was a bit of a crisis and the staff were very busy dealing with the, what, the consequences of what had happened. And she, after about 20 minutes, she said to me, my brother's dead, isn't he? So I said, yes. She said, did you know? I said, yes. Why didn't you tell me? I said, because I enjoyed listening to your stories about him. But if I had told her then that he was dead, she would have been very cross with me, wouldn't she? So to keep on board, you have to enter their reality and often they will then return to yours. Right to listen and to to ask questions and to, as you said, step into their reality and just show that someone cares, right? Yeah, right. make them feel that they're important and valued and accepted. Mm -hmm. Got it, all right. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer, for uh, sharing your insights and your experience. And um, yeah, and thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much, Nicholas. Thanks, Jennifer, bye. Okay. Bye.